So my name is Richard Lilly, and I'm a co-founder and director of the marine ENGO Project Seagrass. ENGO being environmental NGO, a non-governmental organisation. My background is actually as a secondary school science teacher. Um, so I trained as a, a secondary school science teacher in Birmingham. Um, and after teaching for a few years in, in well, Warsaw, just north of Birmingham, I, I went over to uh, train to do a dive master, to become a diving instructor. Um, and that was over in Thailand. Uh, and it was at that point, really, I fell in love with the sea. Um, and I was spending a lot of time taking people out scuba diving. Um, but every day or every few weeks, it constantly felt like we were seeing the destruction of the ocean. And so I felt I needed to know more about this. So I decided to enrol at university. Um, and long story short, I came back to the UK, uh, enrolled at Swansea University to study a, a aquatic ecology um, masters. And it was there that I really found seagrass. And I guess the thing that struck me was I, demographically, as a secondary school science teacher, and particularly a biology teacher, and then as a, a diving instructor, I'd never heard of this habitat. You know, so I'd heard about coral reefs, I'd heard about mangroves. Um, and as I started digging deeper into the literature around seagrasses, it became apparent how important this habitat was, and yet I couldn't square away in my head how I had not heard of this. And, you know, speaking with other people, they'd never, never heard of the seagrasses either. And so the whole re rationale, I guess, for setting up Project Seagrass as an NGO was to try and take some of that scientific content and communicate it to the public and really shine a light on this, on this habitat. Um, so, yeah, co-founded the, the organisation in 2013. So this is nearly 10 years ago now. Um, and really, as I continued to do my academic work, um, which was primarily linked to food security and fisheries linked to seagrass meadows, um, wanted to continue to communicate the science around that. So um, I guess as my academic career progressed, Project Seagrass grew alongside that. And then when I finished my PhD, which was actually on the sustainable supply chain management of small scale capture fisheries, but linked to seagrass meadows. So essentially sustainability of fisheries um, and how seagrass meadows um, help the supply of seafood into that into those systems. So, yeah, after actually three years ago now, I went back into teaching um, after my PhD. And then as Project Seagrass continued to grow, it just got to the stage where we were becoming too big to do with something which was a passion project. And so I left teaching, um, went with Project Seagrass full time, and I've been doing it ever since. I, I guess it was that lack of, lack of um, recognition, I guess, as a habitat. Uh, seagrasses in the UK context anyway, were not part of the marine conservation conversation. Um, the real impetus came from, I guess, from my colleagues who I co-founded Project Seagrass with. One was one, my professor at university, um, and another was a, a friend from the dive club. And when we set up Project Seagrass, we actually set it up out of my student flat in Swansea. Um, and Richard Unsworth, who is, is now my colleague, He'd been previously working on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. So he'd been working at the Queensland Government and at James Cook University over there with Leanne. And so they'd moved back from Australia, I think it was about 2010, and come into a situation where, from Australia, where seagrasses, seagrasses are monitored and mapped and there's you know, ongoing research into those systems, into a, essentially a barren landscape in the UK. And so for them, they were really keen to sort of raise the profile over here uh, and you know, to, to really get them to put seagrasses on the map. So that was the impetus to really, yeah, I guess, raise the profile. And then how that's been intertwined with, with the research and the work is it's kind of evolved. Um, one of the, it's very difficult to care for a habitat or to promote a habitat if no one knows about it. So the first thing you really need to do is say, hey, seagrasses are a thing. This is why they're important. And scientists use the term ecosystem services, but it's like, what does nature give us? And seagrasses give us a whole bunch of stuff which we don't take into consideration. So things like, like our, supporting our fisheries, um, things like blue carbon, they sequester enormous amounts of carbon, so help to mitigate the effects of climate change. And so really it was about celebrating these, these habitats and, and really actually going out and mapping them. So I've just come down this last week from Orkney where we've got an ongoing mapping project. So we're, we're up there flying drones, um, ground truth things, so in water swimming over seagrass meadows, um, and confirming that what we're seeing from the sky is actually seagrass. And then we're creating those habitat maps and we're sharing them with the nature agencies and we're sharing with them the local council so that when they then want to make decisions, they can make decisions based upon data and evidence. So, yeah, I'd say that as the, as the, as the 
well, it's been 10 years now. As the 10 years have progressed, the organisations changed, but the, 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 the rationale has always been the same. We, we want to build a community around seagrass and a recognition around the, the habitat. And we also want to provide robust scientific research and, and data so that people can make decisions. And I think in 2019, there was a real emphasis on action. We wanted to actually see if we could um, really affect change through, through the work that we were doing and have our science inform positive action. And so in 2019, we were part of a group that were delivered the first, what we're going to call full scale or meadow scale seagrass restoration project in the UK. And that was in Dale in Pembrokeshire. So it was two hectares of seagrass. And then from that, we've seen um, just a proliferation of these uh, ecosystem restoration projects. Um, I think aided by the fact that it's the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. So uh, huge, huge impetus there. But um, yeah, ultimately we're about saving the world's seagrass. One of the challenges we have globally with seagrasses is, is they're not particularly well mapped. Um, and that's something which as a global community we're, we're seeking to address. Um, historically in the UK, they haven't been particularly well mapped across the whole of the, the, the islands. So um, having a solid baseline and understanding what we've lost is actually quite hard to do. Um, there's a, a recent PhD which looked into this and there's very good evidence that we've lost at least 44% of our seagrasses, but based upon the modelling, it could be as much as 92. So significant loss of seagrass uh, around the UK. Um, some of that is attributable, attributable to a, a disease that came through in the 1930s and, and uh, wiped out a lot of seagrass. But really a, a massive issue in the UK is water quality. So anything that ends up in the rivers uh, ends up in the estuaries and ultimately that's where we find a lot of our seagrass meadows. And so we've, we know that we've lost seagrass from a lot of the estuaries around the UK and that's been linked to, to historically poor water quality. The optimist in me now looks at the, the opportunity to, to let that recover. You know, we've seen, we've got a restoration project in the Firth of Forth at the moment called Restoration Forth. And we know that historically the water quality in that estuary was frankly abysmal. But over the last 20, 30 years, we've seen significant improvement in that water quality. And so now that that pressure has been removed and the pressure that was threatening the seagrass to be there in the first place, the seagrass isn't recovering naturally because there's not enough seed supply or propagules entering the system. But if we can bring those seeds in, then hopefully we can kickstart that recovery process and then let nature take care of itself. One thing to think about really is that seagrasses globally are, come in all different shapes and sizes. So we've got, depending on which scientist you speak to, let's say 72 different species. Now around the UK, we've only got two of those species. One's called uh, dwarf field grass, which is very, very small um, and tends to be found quite high up on the seashore. And you know, if you're uh, an ornithologist and you're into your bird life, then uh, species like Brent geese or widgeon um, rely on this on their, on their migrations and they consume a lot of seagrass. Um, it's also very good for sta sediment stabilisation. So it being a plant and not an, animal, uh, not a, not an algae means that it, it's a, actually the history of seagrass, they evolved on land and returned to the sea. So they bring with them the characteristics of, marine, uh, of land plants and particularly angiosperms. So they have flowers, they have seeds, they have roots. And that root system helps to, to bind the sediment and to hold it in place. So it helps prevent coastal erosion. Where we see seagrasses being lost, we see increased erosion in those locations. So, you know, for, for, for particularly in, in some coastal communities, that is really quite an important feature of having those, those intact coastal systems, seagrass, seagrass systems. Biodiversity benefits are huge. You know, we learn, on, we learn at 14, I think, in school, where if you have about food webs and food chains, and the classic one would be you have some grass, and you might have a rabbit that eats the grass, and you might have some fox that eats the rabbit. Um, those same systems exist in the sea. In fact, we have sea grass, we have rabbit fish, um, I don't really have sea foxes, but we have you know, predators that will, will eat that. And, but you can see how having that primary producer at the bottom of the food chain really adds productivity to the coastal space. Um, and again, just having seagrass, seagrasses occupy what would otherwise be barren or flat sea floor, you're creating really complex three-dimensional habitats that allow juvenile fish to live in and uh, animals to forage. Um, and so what we see is nearly a fifth of the world's largest fisheries actually can trace their, the origin of those fish that are caught back to seagrass meadows. So hugely important for, for global food security. Um, nutrient cycling, so um, when we overload our coastal waters a little bit with too many nutrients, seagrasses help to, to um, cycle those nutrients, help to reduce pathogens in the marine environment. Uh, yeah, but the, I guess one of the big ones, which is um, really drawn the attention of 
uh, well, humanity at the moment is the, the ability to sequester carbon. So this is to take carbon um, out of the water column and to, to bury it in the sediment. And that probably requires a little bit of explaining. Um, when we think about carbon in terrestrial environments like trees, a lot of the carbon that's getting sequestered or, or stored is actually in the trunk itself or in the organic matter of the plant. And that's wonderful, and it's a very good store over short, relatively short uh, time periods, 200, 300 years. But with seagrass ecosystems, though, because the, sea, the carbon is getting buried not in the, the grass itself, but in the sediments below in the root systems, you're actually seeing carbon there which is buried for millennia. And so when we think about stabilising the climate over millennia now, then that seagrass meadows are a huge asset to have. As a, so as a call to action, um, if there's one thing that you could do to, to um, support, I guess, the, the work that we're trying to do in saving the world's seagrasses, one is just talk about them. You know, one of the, it's been very difficult to conserve a habitat or to drive passion into um, seagrass ecosystems if no one's ever heard of them. So we do a lot of work trying to just celebrate the seagrass ecosystems um, through video, through photography and, and through art and, you know, creative ways of, of communicating seagrasses. Um, uh, so first is, yeah, just raising awareness of the, the, the ecosystem. Second is mapping. So we've got a, a citizen science program called Seagrass Spotter. So it's an app you can download on uh, a smartphone. Um, and through that app, you can, if you come across seagrass, you can take a photo of it. And the GPS is uh, in the photos these days. So that gives us the point on the planet Earth where the seagrass was, fil was, um, was where the photo was taken. Or if you're a scuba diver or surfer or snorkeler, you can retrospectively, um, you know, from a GoPro or other camera, you can load the, the image into the system. But what that gives us is the location data for seagrasses across, across the globe. And the exciting thing is now, because of the advances in satellite technology, we're then able to pair that data with satellite data to start driving global maps of, of seagrasses. Um, and so I'd say they are the big two. You know, from a participatory perspective, seagrassspotter.org. But, but number one is just, just, just be aware of them, talk about them. You know, if one day if we can get seagrasses to be as famous as coral reefs, then uh, we probably won't have half the issues we've got now with management.